Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Canadian Philosophy Show. I am one of your hosts, Tegan Marshall from Vancouver Island University, and I'm here with two of our regular co-hosts, Michael Robert Kaditz from VIU and Nicole Kiergan from Simon Fraser University. And tonight's topic is a fun one, but before we start, I want to thank our radio stations for broadcasting us. Nicole, can you thank our stations for me, please? Yes. Thank you to our stations. <laughs> Which are? Uh, C-H-L-Y and C-J-S-W. Excellent. Thank you, Nicole. So tonight's topic is a very mind-boggling one. In fact, Mikey said before the show began, it's the topic of every on every philosopher's mind. It's the base topic of philosophy itself. The biggest question of our existence, which is our existence. And so in addressing that that question of why we exist or how we exist or what is existence, we're tackling a fun topic, an interesting topic, and for me an annoying topic. Do we live in a simulation? Fun topic indeed, because the questions that arise out of this is, well, first of all, what do we mean by simulation? Second of all, how, how, you know, what are, what are the limitations of all that? And see, the question I will put forward is, does it really matter? So... In order to keep the whole team involved, I'm going to ask Mikey to start us off by defining, um, defining, actually, one more thing. I want to note that this theory, th this argument, the simulation uh, argument, has been, you know, it's quite popular, you know, because in films like The Matrix, um, Elon Musk has talked about it more recently, so it's definitely come back into public opinion. So we want to deal with the, the the pop culture as well as philosophy. So I'm gonna ask Mikey to again because I kind of cut him off there. Define what we mean by simulation. For us. Uh, first, I want to say that um, I'm not an authority on this, and there may be various definitions and understandings of the simulation model. So I'll give you my understanding. So the simulation theory or simulation model holds that we are beings created by a more intelligent being or society using basically computer technology so that we that we live in a in a in a game or that's what we, that's what we mean by simulation we live in a world that was created or that is being created and maintained and manipulated by another civilization or another being maybe it's one being or maybe it's a group of beings and uh, we're actually you know the created by a computer code or by uh, some sort of uh, you know artificial intelligence similar to when we create robots right but this would be more sophisticated so we're, we're essentially artificially created intelligence uh, and uh, and it's also possible that the there's multiple levels of this so perhaps we were created by intelligence which itself is created by an intelligence higher in the chain than that so uh so if you think of a very sophisticated computer game where the programmer has designed and created characters we are characters in someone else's game hmm. interesting so yeah it's it's gonna be an interesting discussion and so I want to begin by um, talking about um, how this has come, as I mentioned, into kind of more popularity. Um, some of the some of the work that has been done on this to to bring up this question, and then we'll have a discussion about about evidence supporting and against this theory, as well as just some 
personal discussions about how how we how we perceive it to be and whether we personally think it's it's a legitimate theory to hold to. It's certainly a fascinating one. So as I mentioned, you know, we have the classic films like The Matrix, you know. Will you take the red pill or the blue pill? That's the question. Will you keep the knowledge he gained in The Matrix or not? Full disclosure, I've never seen The Matrix. <laughs> um, so, there you go. But, um, Elon Musk has been been responsible for bringing this into more of a mainstream kind of thought process lately and Elon takes the position as I understand it um, that that there's almost a zero percent chance if not zero that what we live in is base reality and so what we mean by base reality is is I guess true reality in the sense reality that is outside of any simulation, outside of any external control or manipulation from other beings or entities. Um, and this theory is is based upon a paper by a professor by the name of. What's his name, Mikey? Do you recall? You're, you're I don't muted. have it in front of me right now. Okay. Um, Boastman's work, who is a, is a professor of philosophy at Oxford University. And where Elon and um, Boastman differ is... Bozeman concludes that there's a 20% chance we are living in a simulation, um, whereas Elon thinks it's almost definite we're living in a computer-generated simulation. And so one of the... He's a 50-50. Yeah. On, yes. on a Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah, so according to the video I watched, um, it seemed to be fairly steady, but that probably is a more accurate report. Um, so there is, there's definitely some questions, some questions of how do we explain human history then? And the basic response to that is an idea within the theory of ancestral simulations. So that um, so that our ancestors, I assume, were if not created the simulations, um, were were you know were created into them, and then we've gained knowledge about that through our simulation. It's kind of weird. Mikey, help me out if I'm really butchering it over here. Well. Uh... One way to understand our history, human history or human evolution or our ancestry is that it's all part of the simulation. So imagine, a, you know, a super intelligent computer geek, you know, in a more intelligent and advanced civilization than ours decided to create beings that evolved, that, that started, you know, with certain primitive lifestyles and then over or even primitive physical characteristics and the simulation could include uh, a, a planet where uh, uh, life developed in the water and then crawled out and through the intertidal zones into the uh, onto the land and then um, evolved you know through the chain of evolution as 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 we know it to be that could be that could be all part of a very interesting and sophisticated uh, computer simulation, and we're simply uh, in, in, you know, at a certain point of, uh, you know, in the game. In the game. That's kind of a disturbing analogy for me, but yeah, we'll get there. We'll we'll get there because that's. Uh, oh, go ahead, Nicole. I want to kind of um, simplify the idea of living in a simulation as living almost in a in a video game. You can think of us. Uh, is the, the the simulation hypothesis? I guess you can envision it as we are characters in a video game, 
And, you know, of course, a video game is programmed by outside things. The characters within a video game don't have control over the video game itself or getting out of the video game. And in a way, if you think about it in terms of our society, if we are trying to go for the next job promotion, accumulating wealth, all those things, you can think of it in terms of a video game. And you can also be more specific. If, if anyone here has played, played Minecraft, you can think of the people outside of this simulation as being the pe person who people who are creating the buildings, creating the economic system, creating all the mini games, whatever. And we're the ones inside in, in the game. So that's one way to think about it. That I think really simplifies um, what a simulation really means. Right. And, now, and uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the, the question um, comes up then as to whether we are simply like puppets on a string uh, and, and each one of our decisions and moves uh, is, is programmed by our um, programmer or whether we're more sophisticated than that and whether we actually have a certain degree of free will. So I would argue that, uh, that, it's, that if we have free will, that's entirely consistent with the simulation hypothesis. And here's my, some evidence for that. We are now developing robots and, and, and more sophisticated forms of artificial intelligence. In fact, um, we might not quite be there yet, but we're definitely on the road toward, toward developing artificial intelligence which which actually has some degree of of, of free will um, that that can uh, listen to uh, uh, you know commands and make decisions about how to respond and um, so if, if indeed it's possible to create artificially uh, rather than through natural reproduction but if, to artificially create um, uh, a replicate or replicate um, copies uh, of us or tokens of, of human beings um, that 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 have the ability to make decisions and exercise free will then then it's entirely plausible that our creator the programmer or programmers who made us gave us a certain amount of free will and is sitting there uh, watching this uh, this unfolding drama of these beings that 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 he or she created or it created uh who who seem to make decisions on their own now now mikey um you touched on an important point that that um the video i watched regarding elon musk and simulation touches on is that in the simulation argument there's three possible scenarios um and i can't remember all three of them but i know that one is the fact because humans are rapidly advancing in what they can simulate as you were saying with artificial intelligence um robotic stuff like that humans will will at some point reach a state in which um which i guess almost consciousness and stuff like that could be separated from as we were talking about actually a few shows ago throwing around the idea of um right we we could begin simulating ourselves at some point um now there there's a there's a suggestion that before we get to that point or what's going to limit us from getting that point is a state of human extinction, whether that's by a natural phenomenon or, you know, or some other means. Um, so, so that's something that's suggested. Another idea is that um, when we do get to that point in the future, we may come a point where these ancestral simulations just are no longer done and so simulations are created by self-replicating robots which then go and populate other planets um so what what do you two what what do you nicole and mikey think of that idea um do you see any credence for that um does it freak you out what are your thoughts 
Can you reiterate the idea? The idea of blank? The idea that humans, even though we are advancing rapidly in what we can simulate, probably will never get to a point where we can simulate ourselves. And if we do, if we do, um, the, the chances of us actually creating simulations, you know, ancestral simulations is going to be fewer and far between. And therefore, we, we start creating self-replicating robots, which then start their own simulations. I disagree. I think that we've already come somewhat closer to creating our own simulations. Maybe not the whole kind of comprehensive simulation in the sense that, you know, we're creating another Earth and we're living in another society in this sort of way. But with video games, for example, we have come so far in the past few years. Video games have only really started coming out in, I believe, the 70s. And, you know, with the Nintendo and... Um, Atari and like all those like games, right? Like and and we've come so far in a relatively short amount of time and games are becoming video games specifically are becoming more and more and more realistic. There's going to be, there might be a point to where and also with virtual reality coming out too. There might be a yeah. point to which we won't be able to distinguish video games from reality. So isn't that a form of simulation? What if we can simulate a virtual reality Sims game, you know, the, the Sims? That, that is so realistic that we can't tell the difference and that can be a form of simulation in itself. I think, mm. that, I think that counts. And we're still, we can still come outside of that simulation by going back in the real world. But what is the real world, Nikki? That's the question. I mean, yeah, I mean, we can go into that, but just for the sake of argument here, the real but, world or whatever is, you know, what living and breathing, what we're doing right now at the given point, and then there can we can actually, on the other hand, if, if video games become so realistic, uh, you know, with the VR technology and with uh, and with just the overall complexity that has come in the past relatively short amount of time, given the whole span of human existence, I think it's very likely that we could come very close, if not identical, to our everyday lives within a video game. And I think that's a form of simulation in itself. Sure, might give responding yeah. in. Well, we we have to remember that um that it, that if the simulation model is correct, we're we're a, a product of computing power, and so some of the uh, theorists about simulation models have talked about the uh, the um, diminishment of computing power with each level of simulation. So uh, if 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 simulated creatures were able to create their own simulations and then though then those let's say they created simulations of themselves then then now we have an ancestral relationship and then I now now the simulations of themselves create simulations of themselves we have multi-level simulations but there's going to be a decrease in computing power so each generation or each level in this ancestral relationship between simulation levels will have less and less computing power. Sort of like if you set up a, right now you can set up a virtual server, right? In fact, that's very common now in, in the IT world is to use virtual servers rather than actual physical machines. And, and so on virtual servers, you might have multiple virtual machines, but with each generation of, of virtual uh, computers, you have to, uh, you know, divvy up the resources and you, you still only have your maximum amount of resources is still only the resources on that one physical sh machine the first generation physical machine so likewise uh, with a simulation you have a maximum amount of resources available t to the uh, or, or originator of the simulation and and that will have to be divided up between the you know the the generations that come later so uh, so that that would be one one limitation um, but I wanted to say, point, point out another um, interesting theory that I just come up with. I haven't, didn't come up with this in my research, but think about this, guys. Doesn't the idea that we have a creator, a computer programmer someplace, that created us, doesn't that sound a lot like religion? Doesn't it sound like, like God? <laughs> doesn't it sound like uh, medieval philosophy? 
that uh it does but <laughs> but but okay taking a medieval um christian perspective though the difference is that the creator became man the creator doesn't become the created it doesn't make sense so in unless like yeah i see where you're going but well, we'll avoid the theological, you know, discussions here. But mm. if does the creator become what it's created if it's a simulation? Because if we're in a simulation, the creator then becomes a simulation itself. No, no, no. Because uh, according to uh, you know Saint Thomas Aquinas and um, medi- medieval uh, Catholic philosophers, the the creator must continue to create must must maintain must continue the the uh the, right. the causal chains which begin with the uh creator would would stop happening if the creator didn't continue to to move uh it's a type of causal right. chain that was avo- that's advocated in 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 uh, medieval theology and in cal- right. na- and natural philosophy natural law philosophy right. it's sort of like if i was moving a stick and the stick uh was hitting a leaf and the leaf was hitting um you know uh, uh, a little piece of dirt and the dirt was moving if i stop moving the stick that dirt's going to stop moving so god or, or the creator of the simulation must continue to to input the energy and the in and in the intention into the right. simulation otherwise it would yeah. end. So, the, so the creator cannot become become part of the simulation yeah so one yeah. thing that i'm thinking is i think that that's actually a really good point um michael so in a way, heaven, if you think about it, could be the way out of the simulation. And our world, where did Tegan go? I'm going to take, I'm going to, I'm going to start. Tegan, are you okay? Yeah, sorry, I was uh, checking something and I clicked away. Continue. Okay, your camera's off. Heaven is escaping the simulation. No. Continue. Yeah, I'll start it. I'll start again. So if you think about it from this way, from a theological viewpoint, God is, can be envisioned as the intelligent person or being outside of the simulation, creating the simulation, knowing all the code, knowing what to input. Um, and our everyday life, our earth is the simulation and heaven is the point to which you get out of the simulation. I think that's very, it aligns very closely with um, Judeo-Christian teachings. Well, also this, Descartes, this simulation uh, argument. yeah, Descartes um, used as part of his proof for the existence of God, uh, Rene Descartes argued that, um, that whatever created humans must have more um, formal reality than humans, that, that, mm-hmm. that nothing can be, can be created by something unless that something has has uh, greater uh, f- reality, greater formal reality, or to put it another way, nothing can create itself. So, mm. uh, which is very similar to the the Catholic argument that something must have created humans because they could not self-create. Well, it's it's. I mean, it is a Catholic argument, but it's not distinctly. In fact, it's very Aristotelian in the sense that the the primal cause the first cause which aquinas uses right but that that's a conversation for another day um, we could in fact we're doing a show on natural law and ethical veganism next week that should be right fun. right right we, we don't have, we don't have to go into to religion but i but i'm using that yeah. as as a piece of confirming evidence for simulation hypothesis in other words the strength the strength of Descartes' arguments, the strength of Aquinas' arguments, um, can be used uh, as an argument for simulation hypothesis. Now, of course, Descartes and Aquinas didn't conceive of computer technology and computer simulations, so maybe they were wrong in, 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 in there being a god, but maybe they're right in that there was an intelligence or is an intelligence that is running the whole show. And maybe we can simply call the computer programmer that created the simulation we're in as God. Yeah. And and that's something that uh, Bostrom himself 
um, points out in his his work is he says if nothing else, right? If if we're not in a simulation, at least the argument presents an interesting perspective on you know traditional relig religious values and ideas because it points to something that is deeply within within our our thought process and our psyche um so let let let's talk about let's now move i mean we've been talking about confirming evidence a bit here but let's spend some time talking about uh the the arguments for and the arguments against by using confirming evidence. When we say con when we um when we say can I mean it seems obvious, but I'll just say this for our listeners because it wasn't obvious to me initially. When we say confirming evidence, we don't necessarily mean one hundred percent truthful evidence. But it seems like a strong supporter for the claim we're trying to make. Um, so it may have some validity there. So, Mikey, you, you and I and Nicole were talking before the show about confirming evidence. Um, do you want to talk a bit more about that? And maybe we can ask some questions to Nicole and I and see what, what we come up with. Yeah, I can start with the first point and Michael can take over. Um, and I'm just going off from what Michael and I have discussed about this, but some con there is some confirming evidence of the simulation hypothesis, but there's also disconfirming evidence. And this wouldn't be true philosophy if we didn't truly go over the confirming evidence and disconfirming evidence. I, at least I think so. I think that we're being more thorough if we actually look at the evidence of what that it is given with these theories instead of just talking about the theories as if they exist without any evidence. So I'll give the first one and then Michael, you can take over. So one big piece of confirming evidence, if we are living in a computer simulation, it makes sense that the more intelligent beings would not want us to break that simulation so they are putting limitations coding these limitations into the simulation so that we do not break out of this simulation i said simulation very many many times but um one piece of confirming evidence are these arbitrary laws of physics that we have that we can't break and we can't logically get out of so the, things like the speed of light and gravity. These are things that we have to live with, and they, these are things that limit what we can do as a human species. Um, and then I'll give a not second one here. There's also crime, mental illness, unexplained problems, disease, things that we can't solve. And you could think about these things as population control or things that control us from becoming, kind of capping out our total overall extent to which we can have intelligence to get out of this simulation. So those are two um, pieces of confirming evidence. And I'm going to give the table over to Michael to talk about the third piece of confirming evidence and then some of the disconfirming evidence. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. I, yeah, go I, 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 I got to ask this just because I need to be a controversial person at the moment. What's wrong with my programming? Why am I limited? Why are people limited? Why do bad things happen in the simulation? I think one way to explain it is it's a, a rate limiting thing that we have inputted into our programming to prevent us from <laughs> capping, going past the ceiling. Because if we go past the ceiling, then that will come, make us come too close to actually breaking the simulation. I think that's an easy way to think about it. And I don't know why it would randomly affect one person or another person. Is it random? I would think that maybe it's an algorithm. It could be, there could be an algorithm there. There could be, it could be like random chance. Who knows? I'm not, I'm not the person creating the simulation. I'm sorry. I can't tell you. Yeah. I, I want to clarify. I'm not, I'm not mad at anybody. I'm just trying to play the devil's advocate here and say, but, but, 
anyway, I'll let Mikey talk and then I have some questions regarding the free will concept of the simulation. But go ahead, Mikey. Yeah, I th- I, th- I think you guys are thinking about it in in the wrong way. I'm um, not not a judgment, just a you know um, philosophical statement. I don't think the programmer who cr- created our simulation that in which we live, if 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 we do in fact live in a simulation, um, needed to place arbitrary or artificial limits on our abilities because it's inherent in the system. It, it's impossible for a uh, a being within a um, simulation to step outside of the simulation. It's 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 a logical impossibility because by definition, the the beings or the characters or the any item within the simulation is simply within the simulation and has no capability. It's a in any world. It's a logical impossibility that 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 being could step outside of the simulation. And so it, there was no intentionality or design involved. It's, sim- it's simply, I would argue, confirming the, the, as Nicole was saying, the limitations w- that we observe, that we experience, and many of them quite arbitrary. Um, for, as Nicole pointed out, the, the speed of light w- uh, beyond which we believe nothing can exceed uh, travel, no, 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 mo- moment, no motion can exceed the speed of light, the, f- the rate of free fall. The um, all the various laws of motion, um, the laws of energy. They're they're known to physicists. Uh, they're they're but but they're we don't know why. Um, in fact, it's been a huge problem in in um, Hume um, discussed this problem the, the about the laws of nature and how can we be certain that the laws of nature won't be different tomorrow. They're, they're arbitrary. They just seem to be the case, and so it's a very it's a big mystery, uh, and and so I think that the, the, this the mystery of and the arbitrariness and the and the limits that we experience inexplicably, I think that's confirming evidence for being in a simulation. The simple explanation would be that we're in a simulation, and that and, and what the limits that we experience and observe are simply the bounds of the simulation beyond which is uh, uh, you, you would no longer be in the game but you're now in the uh, ancestral level right and uh, so I, I think it makes complete complete sense and it's very consistent well the, the mysteries and the limitations that we observe in the universe in my mind are entirely consistent with us with us being in a simulation and we're simply witnessing the bounds of the of the world that, that in which we were created Okay. Nikki, do you want to respond to that? Because I have a question for Mikey, but... uh... No, you go ahead. Okay, so... Full disclosure, guys. I think we're in base reality. Okay? I, I I think these limitations we talk about is strictly because we're at a point in history where we don't understand them. Um, I, I don't think that has anything to do with some, some, some kind of programmed thing or, or human limit, although I do think there's actual human limitations on reason because we're human, but, um, that's another story. So, but my question is, Mikey, what about the old adage there, and I mean, I guess this fits with the simulation, actually, as confirming evidence. The old adage that that there is no such thing as reality, rather only perception. What do you think about that? I, I need you to um, elaborate on that more. Like, I don't understand your... The, what's, the, what's your question? The al- yeah. My question is, in the statement I just said, that there's no such thing as reality, only perception, it suggests that reality is a subjective thing. Are we saying that reality within the... Because I'm going to call the simulation reality for me. It, because to us, that is reality. We're, you know, <laughs> that's just it. That's what we live in. That's what we exist in. Um... So the the question is, it, is each simulation subjective? 
<laughs> and I mean, I guess my question is, how the heck does free will work? Because free will is not something that it can be programmed. Okay, so there's two questions there. Um, okay, think about um, Immanuel Kant. Um, right. Kant. Kant proposed uh, a, a noumenal world um, to which we have no access, but is right. the source of our experiential world, our phenomenal world. Uh, but we don't know anything about that noumenal world. So Kant, Kant, and Kant developed this theory of the noumenal world to which we have no access, but is the source and the phenomenal world in which we live as a way to solve some big problems. One of the problems raised by David Hume, um, which I alluded to earlier, which is the the arbitrariness of the laws of nature and no justification for claiming that they won't change tomorrow. So, so Kant's response was, to simplify a complicated thing, his response was, well, in the phenomenal world, we can assume that the laws of nature are, are consistent, although we have no access to the noumenal world. Well, Kant was trying to solve a problem. Maybe the problem that he was trying to solve is the one we're now looking at, which is what, what, what created us? What created this phenomenal world we live in? And maybe the and, and so this is a model. It's a hypothesis for what created the phenomenal world. A problem that was well recognized by Kant and by Hume. And here's a model. The simula the simulation hypothesis is a model. To explain. The this discrepancy between seemingly two worlds, the noumenal and the phenomenal. The pheno the noumenal world described by Kant may be, the higher up level. Maybe the world of the, the of the civilization that that has programmers that created simulations that we're in, or a simulation that we're in, and we have no access to it. But because, just because we're okay, just just because we're created, does that automatically equal simulation? No, no. Uh, a simulation so, would be yeah. would be one type of. Uh, Creation. I mean, you conceivably, you could have a natural creation. I, mean, I guess the religious theories say that God created natural beings. So we have a, you know, in the religious model, perhaps we have a, we we, are, we live in base reality. Um, so there's some distinction between, perhaps the. Well, it, you know, it's uh, it's it's again the distinction between. It's it's the it's natural law, right? Natural law predisposes that we live in base reality. Yeah, but think about it. Um, what what is base? What's the distinction actually between base reality and a simulation? I mean, if if a if a if an intelligent being used electricity, which is a physical thing, to uh, to create intelligence in a in a you know to to run a computer program and to use um, uh, I mean that's a physical thing. So why isn't that base reality? So this this is highly philosophical. I mean, is there really a distinction between organic yeah. and biological reproduction versus electronic or um, synthetic reproduction? I mean, it's all physical. In the end, it's all the same thing. Whether it's physical but, or not physical, it's all the same thing, right? Well, it's not because okay. they're sentient. So are human beings sentient? <laughs> Nicole, what do you think? Are human beings sentient? I think that a lot of people go around living life and not thinking about living the way they're living life. That's um, kind of one reason why the study of existentialism has started um, to really make us think about how we're living our lives. But I think, and there's some people I think that can, and I think everybody has the capability to do this, but in particular, there's some people who have really spent time thinking about the meaning of life and what, why we are doing things on a daily basis. And I don't know, I don't know if we can never truly come to an answer for that, so that might be confirming evidence for why 
we are living in a simulation because for many years, I would say since the beginning of philosophy, you know, since the beginning of time, not the beginning of time, but since the beginning of the time that people have been thinking about these existential questions, we haven't come to definitive answer for what's the reason for our existence. So in a way, you can think about that of as confirming evidence for the, you know, for the reason that we're living in a simulation. Yeah, you asked about free will earlier, Tegan. Um, now, imagine that a clever, geeky computer programmer who was spending his or her time trying to improve uh, his or her ability, his or her it or whatever, <laughs> however we'd categorize beings in that civilization, hypothetical civilization, uh, and eventually got so skilled that, that, that she developed the technology to create artificial beings, or what I'm arguing might be natural beings, <laughs> which had free will, which had the capability to make decisions on their own. So uh, it certainly is plausible that uh, that even humans uh, are on the way now or getting close to creating artificial intelligence that can actually have a degree of sentience and, and also a degree of free will. In other words, um, make decisions and behave in a way that is not um, predetermined, but rather is... Um, um, you know, arbitrary or if not arbitrary in some way, um, you know, not predetermined, pro probabilistic. That would be a feat, a, a techno techno technological feat that a skilled programmer could possibly achieve would be to create beings in a simulation which have some degree of probabilistic uh, decision making, which mm. Uh, were experienced uh, by those beings as "quote unquote" free will. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. And that and okay. and that clever programmer and 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 his or her fans and followers would be amazed at how fun it was to sit there and watch this simulation and watch these beings make unpredictable decisions. Hmm. Well, you know, I guess that's where, that's where, I guess, for us non-simulated humans, which I am one, um, I refuse to submit to the simulation, um, that I, I rebel. If I wind up dead tonight, we know we pissed off the, the programmer, but, um, if, I guess that's where you have to I think I think all this evidence is too convenient. It, it's too convenient. And as we pointed out in our prior discussion, this theory is not what was the term Nicole is not refutable or something like that. It's like it's not able to be fully outright denied, I think, is what it is. So, in a sense, I don't know how you feel, Nicole, just because we haven't heard from you in a bit. Doesn't this seem... Doesn't this seem too... To me, it seems too convenient that you're pulling on these... these... these general aspects of just human existence, limit, limits of experience, limits of int intelligence, the fact that we we can we can you know do video games, virtual reality stuff like that doesn't doesn't it just seem too convenient? And do you think this is refutable, or do you think this is one of those things that it's a theory and we're never gonna have a yes or no answer? You're asking me. Yeah. Mm hmm. I mean, if you look at the main reason for why we say that we study history, to understand the future, 
if I study history in the sense that I look at all the philosophy that has been performed over the over the years, and there's so many of these fundamental questions, independent of the simulation questions that haven't been answered, then mm. I would say, based on the trajectory of history, I don't think that we will answer the simulation question because it's just as difficult, if not more difficult to answer than all the other fundamental questions that we've asked in philosophy. Man. Oh man, there's so much we could do. Um, so in the last 12 minutes, why don't we make basically our closing arguments for what side we land on? We'll start with Mikey. Are we in a simulation, and how does this affect your life going forward? Well, but before I give my final um, verdict, I just wanted to clarify or give my um, understanding of the argument that you just raised, that you, the two of you just discussed, which is the falsifiability argument. So this is one of the um, pieces of disconfirming evidence or the arguments against the, the um, simulation hypothesis, which is that it's simply not falsifiable. And there is uh, not an absolute, but there is a tendency for many scientists, not all, and, it's, and there's, this can be refuted actually, but um, there's a tendency to favor scientific theories or give more credibility to scientific theories that are falsifiable, which, and you can understand why. Because if a claim is falsifiable, if there's some criteria or some way, there's some um, evidence, there's some um, uh, uh, you know, perhaps empirical evidence that could be found that would show a claim to be false, then in a sense the claim is stronger if that evidence has not been discovered. So if you make a claim uh, that um, you know that that Michael's dead. If that's your claim, well, if you can find evidence that I'm alive, then your claim is refuted. If you can't, if you can't, if there's no heartbeat and there's no, <laughs> and there's no breathing, and there, then 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 um, you can't find evidence that Michael's alive, then you have a more strongly supported claim that Michael's dead. The problem with um, with theories like the uh, the um, simulation hypothesis is there's really no way to disprove it. There's no way to falsify it. It's not, you know, accessible. So you could argue that it's sort of a useless theory because there's no way to gauge, there's no way to determine, to determine um, the truth of the theory because there there would be no way to to prove its 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 untruth. Uh, I mean, think mm -hmm. about um, think about this claim. There is no intelligent life in the universe other than on Earth. That's my claim. Well, that's not falsifiable. There's no, there's no way that anyone, anyone could disprove that theory, because no one could look in every corner of the universe, or even know where every corner of the universe was, to show that there was no life there. And and and, and even if one did look in every corner of the universe, where they are looking in all the possible places, places in all the possible ways, so it's it's kind of a pointless statement, right, to say, oh, there's no life on, in the universe except for you know, on Earth, it's 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 kind of a you know meaningless statement. So likewise, one could say, well, the, to claim that you know we only exist in a simulation is meaningless in the sense that it can't be disproved. We we can't like like do an experiment and then the results of the experiment will 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 will, will either prove or disprove the theory. So that's that's an argument against. Um, I just want to acknowledge that I think that's one of the strongest arguments against the simulation model is that it's meaningless because it can't be shown to be false. Yeah. Um, and if I can add on yeah, to that, yeah, I would yeah. say that there's a lot of other um, philosophical arguments that um, can can also can't be falsified. And one of them that has a lot of contention behind it is the psychological egoism argument which is the view that humans are always motivated by self-interest and selfishness, even in what seems to be acts of altruism. So if you think about it, why am I on this show? 
you could I could say, oh, I want to spread, um, you know, the my love of philosophy. I want to get the public engaged with philosophy. But anybody could argue that I'm on this show because I'm I want to bolster my resume or whatever. Right. But that those claims are not falsifiable. Um, and let me think of an, another another reason. So if you see somebody, if you're walking on the seawall and you see somebody drowning in the where the, the harbor is and you jump in to help them, somebody could say, OK, um, they're being altruistic. They're trying to save somebody's life. But you could also argue that that person has jumped in and saved somebody because they want to be viewed as a hero to to make to kind of bolster their own feelings of self-worth and everything. So that psychological egoism is a very, I would say, a more well-known type of that argument, but there's many arguments in philosophy that can't be falsified. Yeah, I think you're um, saying something similar to what I've pointed out, which is the uh, claim that altruism doesn't exist. So if I were to claim that altruism exists, that would entail the assertion that by definition, everything anyone does is for the because they get some benefit from it, even when they're helping somebody else. So my claim is that altruism doesn't exist because even selfless behavior by definition would not be undertaken if the person initiating that behavior didn't have some motivation and reason to do it. And that motivation and reason to do the supposedly selfless behavior in some way would benefit or is attractive to the person initiating it. Therefore, it's not altruistic. But the problem with that anti-altruism argument is that it's not falsifiable because then by, there's no way to prove that anyone could ever do anything selflessly because I've my argument is that by definition everything someone does is for their own benefit so it's sort of a pointless argument so what's the point in saying altruism doesn't exist it's not falsifiable okay thank you for um, getting us on that track I think so I think that's probably one of the strongest arguments against the simulation model that it's sort of pointless because there's no way to disprove it um, but I'll tell you where I land. I land, uh, notwithstanding that falsifiability argument, I land on the, let's say, that it's quite pl pl plausible and that that we are in a simulation. That's all I'm, I'm not going to say we are. I'm going to say that it's plausible, and I like the theory. I like the model. I think there's a lot of strong evidence for that model and I think the strongest piece of evidence is the arbitrary limitations that we as humans here I have Bertrand Russell the problems of philosophy the philosophers have been working for over 2,000 years since Plato and before before Plato to answer certain questions perhaps the most fundamental one as Tegan alluded to earlier is why is there something rather than nothing what is existence? Why why does anything exist? How come in 2,000 plus years, human beings haven't been able to answer that question? We're stumped as ever. I think yeah. the idea that we live in a, a simulation is a very, is probably the best answer <laughs> that we've ever come up with as to why there is something rather than nothing. The something is was created by the, by technology that we are now beginning to understand is plausible, which is creating computer games, computer simulations, and artificial technology. So I'm going to land. That's that's my final statement. Is it's plausible, and the case is very strong for the claim that we exist in a simulation. Uh, Nikki, you're up. Where do to, you? Yeah, where, I would. Where? I would have to somewhat mirror what Michael has said here. I think that there are good arguments to justify why we might be living in a simulation, but I don't think it's a problem that we will solve in our lifetime. At least, I could be wrong about that. That it would be interesting if we did, but I would be kind of scared to 
go that route and <laughs> it, it would be it would be really I don't know what would happen if we were to find out or discover that we live in a simulation I I anticipate that that would destabilize the entire socio-political structure we have in the world and I, I'm not sure that would be interesting but I don't know if I would want to live in that <laughs> because our world is already messed up that's what I think uh, so I got two minutes and 45 seconds to convince you that you are not in a simulation. I strongly disagree with my colleagues on this one. I will die disagreeing. But, okay, maybe I won't do that. But for this moment in my mental development, I disagree. And I'll tell you why. I think the fact that philosophers have been working to answer the question of human existence exists because it's not because we don't have the answers. It's not that we don't have answers, but it's that we cannot agree on an answer. Because, as Mikey stated, we have free will. And this is the uniqueness of human beings, is the ability to rationalize, debate, and have difference of opinion. We're not, we're not just this collective, you know, we're not like the Borg from Star Trek that finds their identity and we are Borg. We are this thing. But I am Tegan Marshall. Nicole is Nicole. Mikey's Mikey. We come from extremely different backgrounds, even though as humans, we have the same human experiences. You know, polling from Sartre, there is no human nature, only shared common human experience. But that does not mean, that does not mean that because there's a, a diversity in thought that we live in a simulation, because of the limit, limits of knowledge that we have, is not because, does not directly point as we've said, this whole show, this is all confirming evidence. So I'm arguing against confirming evidence. And that in my mind, the fact that we don't have an answer to what, or uh, we have answers, we just have not agreed on a unified answer. And so the, the, the problem is that humans are, are just, we like to be different. We like to be individuals. And I think this is my concern with, um, with, with the, with the, I just think that's why I struggle with the idea of, of just that idea that, well, look at the limit of knowledge. The reason we have limit of knowledge is because partially we have different experiences, we have different avenues, and we don't agree. Yeah, but Tegan, I mean, Tegan, yeah, um, yeah. scientists can prove things. They can prove yeah. the way the physical world works. Philosophers who aren't so much concerned with the laws of physics are yeah. thinking beyond, and they haven't yeah. been able to prove anything. All you, as you just said. All we have as philosophers are a bunch of different viewpoints and opinions and models, and there's no way to prove any one of them correct. Why? I'm saying the reason we can't is because we can't get out of our simulation. Now, th if we're in a simulation, okay, let's say that we are now creating we're, a simulation, right? If you're a computer programmer creating a simulation, you have all the answers. You do yeah. know what's happening, but the, that the characters in your simulation don't. That's entirely consistent with what's happening here. The reason we don't have answers is because we can't get out of our own simulation. The people that created us, or the beings that created us, they have all the answers, but we don't. Well, in a sense, right? Uh, we won't get into that. We are out of time. <laughs> so I am your your leader for tonight, Tegan Marshall, here with Nicole Kerrigan and Michael Robert Kaditz. Michael's from Vancouver Island University. Nicole is from Simon Fraser University. And I am also from Vancouver Island University. Wanting to take a moment 
again to thank our broadcasters, Chili Radio at Vancouver Island University and CJSF from SFU for broadcasting us. Thank you for doing that and supporting us as students and graduates as we grow in our knowledge of our discipline. Everyone have a wonderful evening and we'll let you decide. Comment on our Facebook page, The Canadian Philosophy Show. Do you think we live in a simulation? We'll see you there. Good night.